tonight um, just wide open, right? This is just kind of a, like an office hour. We can do that. We can also throw some questions at them and say, you know, want me to help you? Make me co-host. I'll help you get in. You are you're already co-host. Okay, because I didn't see that someone was coming in. Okay. Nobody is yet. Um, you know, what are some create, I, Mary Beth and I tomorrow on the um, group coaching, which is group two, uh, those are people who are starting to get some traction, you know, attending, they're engaged, um, creative ways to get listings. So we probably don't want to do that tonight in case we have okay. the same audience. Do but, you think the same audience would be in your group two that would be in this? Maybe not. Because <laughs> group two is by invite only, correct? Yeah. So we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We shall see what happens. I did send out, and you probably uh, hopefully got a copy of it. I did send something yesterday just to remind people of what was going to happen this week. I think what I find is when I send those announcements, people, you know, remember, I think here comes Leslie. Um, I'll get her. We have, we had like 500 people read the email. So, you know, we'll see what that translates into. Yeah. Now, Leslie may be on group two. There's Leslie. Now it's a party. <laughs> and here comes Catley. Hi. All right. Catley's here as well. Good stuff. Leslie, what group are you in? Are you in group two or group three? Um, in, uh, what do you mean? And for the afternoon coaching, the Tuesday afternoon coaching, is that on your schedule or is it Wednesday from two to three? I never got anything. Should I have? Yes. No, I never got anything. All right, we're on it. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes when you ask the questions, you find out what you don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, hey, Laura. I'll be on video in like five, five, well, like three minutes, so. All right. No worries. How are you, Laura? How are you, Ketley? All right. It's six o'clock. We got lots of folks coming in now. That's exciting. And Mr. Lagashi is here as well. My goodness. Oh, my God. Now, Ron, you didn't get confused that you're doing it tonight, did you? <laughs> no, I didn't. I just uh, I'm waiting for a client to show up to the showing. So I figure I'd jump in for a few minutes until she shows up. Outstanding. Good stuff. Well, we'll give, people, we'll give people a minute to get in. Guys, tell me something good. Give, let's start tonight with some gratitude. What's uh, going on in your real estate lives or in I your life? Start. I'm start working off. on my first thing ever, really, um, a referral right now. Awesome. Yay. Are you? And yeah. is it a referral that you're receiving or a referral that you're sending? I'm sending one. Awesome. So Where somebody in my sphere of influence um, was looking for an apartment down the shore. So it's it's just a lease, but it's something. It's I something. found her an agent. I connected them. I did the paperwork and command, and I've been following up. Beautiful. That's how you do it. Mm -hmm. And you know, not for nothing, dollar per hour, giving a referral to somebody else and letting them do all the work, and then you collect a portion of their commission when it closes is probably the dollar per hour highest earnings that you can make in this industry. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't say that tongue in cheek. It absolutely is. Yeah, I have um, a, a friend, her mother is in real estate and I teach with her. And that was the first thing she said when I got my license. She's like, you need to just do referrals. <clears throat> yeah. And I'm seeing why she told me that now. <laughs> well, you know, there's there's a whole lot of folks who who make it a point to, to keep grooming their networks and building their referral networks in different places and, and just being, you know, a pathway to that. I'll, I'll share with you a story as we're waiting for folks to, get, to come here. Uh, there was an agent that I used to work with back when I ran the Montclair Market Center a number of years ago. And she was a woman who um, came from Toronto, Canada right? Which is where Keller Williams has a pretty strong presence. And she came, actually, she was one of our first investor partners when we opened up that KW in Montclair. And very public story, so I'm not sharing things I shouldn't, but she, as a kid, had a kidney transplant. And about 25 years later, she was at a point in her life where it looked as though she was going to need another kidney. And, and she, she knew, she recognized at some point that this may happen. And one of the things that she intentionally did was that she focused on her referral business because she knew that there may be a time when she physically couldn't go out and take the listing herself or go out and show buyers herself. But if she continued to work her very international network 
and be the source of connecting people to other agents and other markets, she could continue to have an income stream when the time came. And lo and behold, when she did finally need a, a kidney transplant, that's how she did it. And she pretty much maintained her, her income. And she was a top agent. She pretty much maintained her income, even though she physically couldn't do it. So the good news for, for you or for anybody on this call is the reason maybe why we're developing our referral business is not because we've got a physical ailment right? But it's that it can be when you're purposeful about it, it can be an amazing source of revenue, right? And I'll just tell you another uh, end, happy ending story to this. You know, she got to a point when she needed a kidney that she wasn't so easy to match. And uh, she was really getting fairly sick. And um, I remember talking to her because I have a background in healthcare and she was really kind of wondering, was she going to find a match or not? And one of her friends just happened to put on Facebook, you know, keep her in your prayers, right? Because she's sick and it's not looking positive that we're going to find a match. And lo and behold, someone who was in her Facebook uh, network, who happened to be a team leader, a friend of mine, a team leader in Michigan, kind of looked at the story and said, you know what? I'm at a point in my life where I feel like I want to make an impact. And she went out and she got some blood work done. And long story short, um, that team leader's kidney is now in Andrew's body two years later. Wow. And it happened through a Facebook post. Wow. And someone who said, you know what? I don't know who she is, but I just feel like I want to do something to change somebody's life. And I feel like it's a legacy gift. And just on a lark, she got her blood tested and she turned out to be a match. Wow. Go, go figure, right? It's one of the, and I, the funny part about it is I knew both of these women separately from different worlds. And when I realized that this was happening, I, I called her and I said to her, how A, did you find Andrea? And B, what is it like to donate a kidney to somebody you don't even know, right? Just a remarkable, amazing, amazing story. And uh, the power of uh, the universe sometimes, right? So anyway, has nothing to do with real estate, but I want you to keep developing that referral business as well, because that's just a great source of revenue. And you know how you... Those that networking, that outreaching, where you really don't know where something's going to come from, where you put stuff out to the universe, and the next thing you know, somebody knows somebody who knows somebody, and you've got a lead. Yeah, and then you're up at bat. Yeah, and, and that's the name of the game, right? You never, never, never know. So that said, let's talk a little bit about tonight. Tonight is one of the nights on this calendar and this Career Builders 24 sessions that we left intentionally very loose. We didn't have an agenda specifically tonight. Now, tomorrow, we have a pretty clear agenda. And Patty and Ron Lagashi are going to talk about working with buyers and talk about how to qualify buyers and how to screen buyers and maybe run some of the frustration of being a buyer's agent in the, this market, which is unlike anything we've ever experienced before, right? But that's tomorrow. And if you don't know Ron, you're in for a treat. Come on back and, 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 and you'll, you'll learn a lot from him and Patty mm -hmm. as well. But today we left open because we wanted to have a place where, where we gave it to you to start to bring up, what is it that you wanna talk about? What is it that you feel challenged by in your real estate business? What are your biggest challenges? What are your biggest burdens? What are your biggest celebrations? This is kind of your hour to use in whatever way you want. And Patty and I are, are, are here to answer whatever we can and share whatever insights and Ron as well. So, you know, we can sort of lead with some questions and things like that, but I'd love to just kind of put it out to you guys and say, yeah, you have three experienced um, agents here who can answer lots of questions. What What is it that we can answer for you tonight? And you don't all have to rush to answer that either. <laughs> Hi, I actually, um, I have a question. Um, actually, if someone could just shoot some advice, but it's actually pertaining to buyers. Um, I have a question about VA loans. I just, I really feel like a lot of listing agents kind of advise to go against VA loans and being on a buyer's, being a buyer's agent and having someone that has a VA loan. I just kind of say, what can I do better to strengthen my contracts or my offers with veterans at this point in this market? That's a yeah, good question. That's a great question. 
Yeah. And uh, I, I want to, I'm going to defer to Ron first for starters, just to get yeah. your perspective on this, Ron, since you are working with so many buyers right now yourself. And then, and even before I do that though, Amy, be, I guess my question to you is why, what is it about the VA loans that the listing agents have been pushing back on you against? Is it the low down payment? Is there something else about that loan that concerns them? So it's just more, I guess, about the um, the contingencies, like as far as the appraisals and the inspections, um, that they feel that you know it's going to be delayed for them. They want uh, you know faster closings, and they just feel like I get that stigma from VA. And I'm I'm new in the industry. I've only been in per, uh, an agent for like six months, so I'm still learning. But I'm just hearing what a lot of agents have to say about the VA loans, and it's just more about the appraisals will take too long. You know, they're a lot more um, strict when it comes to the inspections. So they don't want to waste their time in something that may fall through. Mm -hmm. When you have cash buyers who are waiving all these contingencies. Um, and it's not to say that they have low credit or anything of that sort, but they're a veteran and they want to use that benefit of, you know, in their home buying process. So it's just kind of like, how do you stand out? <laughs> And, you know, just make, like I said, to maybe strengthen the contract a little bit better. Yeah. Well, I see Ron has unmuted himself and he is our buyer specialist. So, so I've, uh, we, I myself and some other team members have had VA loans accepted uh, in multiple other situations before, yet everything you just said is the challenge, are the obstacles, are the barriers, because it does weaken our offer when. Um, you know, the, uh, the, when the appraiser comes out, they're going to be flagging any health or safety issues when the other offers are saying, I'm purchasing it as is. And, you know, if they're putting a very low down payment or even no down payment, uh, they can't waive their appraisal contingency yet other buyers can. So it, it just weakens your offer, um, from different perspectives yet, you know, you're going to strengthen it any which way you can. You're going to, uh, you're going to, discuss strategies with them, you know, because there are different opportunities out there. Uh, maybe there's uh, properties that, uh, you know, are maybe in different areas that are overpriced and there's no, you know, maybe their days on market is 30 days on market. Anything that's more than two weeks on market in today's market is an overpriced property, likely doesn't have any offers on it. So okay. you can look at those properties that are, have a higher days on market count. You can look at different areas to increase your options. So there's a little bit more footwork involved, yet you can create the strategies so um, to, to lead into that, uh, to the outcome they're looking for, which is to be in a home that they're going to enjoy, yet, you know, you have to kind of create those opportunities. The one thing I can tell you when it comes to the deposit, you have to provide a deposit. You can't have no consideration. Mm -hmm. So if you're already going to do that, get creative with the offer, because what you're going to do um, you know, you're going to put 5,000, 10,000, whatever amount of money they have, right? So mm -hmm. they have to provide something as a, as a deposit. Well, now all of a sudden, the way you're structuring it on the offer, it's not a zero down payment anymore. So Correct. let's just say, for instance, it's a $3,000 house, but they're putting $10,000 down. I'm sorry, 400,000 and they're putting $10,000. It's, it's almost 3%. You know what I mean? So it's like... Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's not a zero down loan. It strengthens it that much, right? And then obviously what they end up, they have to pay closing costs anyway, right? Mm -hmm. You're not, unless you ask for the contribution towards closing costs, then it's a different story. But if they have to pay closing costs anyway, and your closing costs is going to be eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000, it's about that amount, then they're still yes. going to be closing with 0% down. It's just that the, that additional deposit will end up going towards their um, cost, the their settlement costs. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. So you have to- Ron, let me ask you a question about the yeah. VA loan. It was my understanding that most should be zero down. And although they could put money down to make they their could. offer strengthen, but they get it back at closing, uh, maybe to cover closing costs. Is that what you just described? Yeah, they have closing costs. They, they have to cover their own closing costs. So if the closing costs are nine, 10,000 and that's their deposit, well, the deposit is gonna go straight towards that in essence, they're still closing with 0% down. Yeah, yeah. So. And Amy, maybe this isn't the climate for them to take advantage of their VA housing benefit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe they could apply for a different type of financing, depending on how 
necessary, they need a house yeah. right now. And and that's the okay. thing I was just going to add. That's a once one time benefit, correct? As being a veteran, you get to do it once. And and if you're gonna if you're gonna try to use it in this kind of competitive market, it it, it may be hard, right? It may okay. Be hard. And, and I guess the other thing to think about, there's there's two other things I want to add in. You know, I, I think if the house, you know, again, when the bank has more skin in the game than the buyer does, which they always do, let's face it, whether even if you're putting 20% down, even if you're putting mm -hmm. 40%, the bank's putting more in than you are. Mm -hmm. But when you get into these thresholds of 3%, 5%, 0%, and the bank is so much more invested they are going to require the house to pass not only just um, the appraised value, but they are going to have the health and safety issues as well because the bank is more liable for any lawsuits. Okay. So one of the things to start to think about is, you know, how, how significant of an issue is that with this particular property? Do you anticipate big health and safety issues? Um, because, you know, a lot of homes, they're not going to trigger big deal issues. Right? Mm -hmm. The home has been well maintained. It doesn't have, you know, any kinds of things like peeling paint or loose treads on stairs or missing handrails or things like that. It's kind of a theoretical issue, but not a real issue, right? You know, so Perfect, yeah. sometimes we can we can point back to that as well, right? Okay, thank you for that. I really appreciate the help and all the advice, guys. Okay, sometimes guys, I want to just I want to comment on one other thing. Go ahead, Patty. I just want to finish that up, but go ahead. Then finish it up. It's okay. Well. I think as listing agents, I'm going to put the hat on the other side here for a second. As listing agents, we have to be really careful about how we steer people into accepting offers based on finance type. And, and here's why. Um, many, many times, the, the thing that the seller's agent is concerned about is that these don't have a lot of down payment. And so they perceive that as lack of motivation or with so little skin in the game, the first little hiccup that comes into the deal, they can kind of walk away, no harm, no foul, and they're not really financially impacted because they don't have a lot of money down, mm -hmm. right? And, and on some levels, I get that. I really do. Uh, you know, what's important in the escrow deposit is that money being held in an escrow account acts as a bucket of money. So if the buyer breaches the contract, there is this reserve of money to try to find a damages claim and pull it out of that the less money that's in that bucket, the less money potentially there to offset any damages that a seller has. But here's the thing that we have to be really careful about. And the National Association of Realtors has been very vocal about this of late. Certain types of financing products, especially the low down payment products like FHA and um, even to some degree VA, they tend to be more attractive to folks who don't have a lot of money who don't have the, you know, for a lot of reasons, they haven't been able to save the 20% down payment or, or whatever that is. They qualify, they're employed, they've got jobs, they've got good credit. They just don't have buckets full of cash to put down payment money down. And when you think about our industry and the history of our industry and the history of how we have steered people into certain communities mm -hmm. based on color and race, and those communities didn't, appreciate in value the same way as others did. What, what it's very apparent is that we've got a long legacy of being part of a system that has created a huge inequity in intergenerational wealth between people of color and people who are white. And what NAR is saying mm -hmm. is that if we steer people to not take a, v, a FHA loan or a low down payment loan simply because there's not as much money that we are potentially engaging in, in, in discrimination. So how are you saying that I'd be wrong to um, guide a buyer in this market to seek something other than a VA finance? If it was because the person who is having conventional financing has more money in the deal, then yeah, I am saying that that's going to be potentially problematic right now and, wow. and, and going forward. And it should be because what we know and the research tells us, and I've checked this out with all of our lending partners, our, myself, a, a properly qualified VA loan does not fail at any higher level than a properly qualified conventional loan does. 
They don't fall apart. They don't create any risk. So if we as a listing agent are saying, take the one with 20% down versus the one with 5% down, then that can become a proxy for a, 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 a racial discrimination case. And that's it's a interesting. Very, yeah. It's a very wow. interesting stand. And one that I think we as an industry need to really wrap our heads around. And thanks for pointing that out to me, because, you know, sometimes you come from innocence and still end up in trouble. So thank you. Well, sure. And, and, um, and we've we've all been as, as been in this industry for a long time. We've all sort of sort of had that logical thought that 20 percent down is safer for you than 5 yeah. percent down. And yet it can also create problems. So just be aware of that. Right. Be aware. We, yeah. What we look at is what's the price and what are the terms and the size of the down payment should be irrelevant. Did you see the Inman? Uh, was it this morning um, or was no. it yesterday? There are um, people in New York, some realtors in New York who are being investigated for fair housing violations, far more blatant, uh, literally teaching, treating differently, asking different questions. Well, I, I, I didn't see the Newman story, but I, I do know that that's an issue that's been out there for a long time. If you go to the Bergen County Partners YouTube channel, and you look at some of the videos that I recorded over the summer about um, you know, racial equality in real estate. One of the th stories that I referenced was the, the Newsday story from, from Long Island from a number of years ago, which you know, with hidden camera video footage actually showed folks treating testers very, very differently. If you mm -hmm. were white and looked mm -hmm. like me, then they would show you homes without necessarily requiring you to produce any pre-qualification documentation. However, if you were black, then you would have to be able to produce a pre-qualification first. And that kind of stuff still exists in our industry, unfortunately. And we have got to do a better job of that. Yep, yep. And yeah. along that line, sometimes on rentals, when um, the landlord is asking for an interview, just be cautious that that's not the reason they're asking for the interview. Yep. By the way, Pat, meanwhile, you guys talking about discrimination. I'm doing more rental now than uh, any other business. I just closed in one this afternoon. Um, what happened is um, some landlord, they asked for a certain amount of credit score or income. And then I have some client I'm working, they're so upset. Um, I'm going to ask if, it's, if you can consider that like a discrimination. Because I don't know, it's because of what's going on with COVID, you know, for any taken evict people. So, what do you think it falls? I'm sorry, sorry, some of it you were breaking up. Tell me, what was the landlord asking for? Um, credit score, so like certain amount. If the client doesn't have like six. 80 or 675. Oh, the credit score. Okay. Right. And then income as well. So are you consider that like uh, a discrimination or not? Because of no. what's going on with uh, COVID, um, it's hard. It's yeah. hard. Uh, Historically, what I can tell you, Ketley, is that um, the industry has looked at credit score and income as objective. Uh, and, and really your capacity to pay independent of any other kinds of biases that we might hold. It has nothing to do with races. Yeah. Historically, that's been the way that the industry has looked at that. Now, okay. look, here's what we know is that this pandemic has not treated people across the board the same way. Certain folks have weathered this pandemic better than other folks have. And I do believe that you know, income loss due to pandemic does disproportionately affect some folks more than others. And can that set of dots be connected and to sort of look at credit score and income as more of a bias issue than anything else? There isn't any precedent for that yet that I'm aware of. And I don't know whether that's an easy precedent to make um, because historically those two items have looked at just income and credit score as your capacity to pay your bills on time. And that's the one area where the judgment um, is pretty firm, pretty clear that that's the basis on which a landlord can make a judgment as to whether to accept a tenant. Yeah. Now, in certain instances, and I um, was working with a friend who had run into some tough times and needed a rental and she was a section eight. Do you all know what a section eight is? Yes, I do know. Yeah, and it's I see- not. Let's, let's, let's put it this way. Who, right now. 
anybody not know what section A is, let's do it that way because I want to make sure anyone who doesn't know, we explain it for you. Okay, we're good on section eight. Okay, so she's a section eight and I was taking care of her because she was my friend. I didn't refer her to anybody. And it is against the law to discriminate against someone who's financing in part comes from the government. Um, the concern is the section eight allocation may not cover the entire rent. So then the landlord gets nervous. That is this tenant going to be able to make up that, that difference? And I found, cause I mean, she's, she's lovely that offering an interview um, made the difference that I could put the tenant and the landlord together and the landlord could then see he was dealing with someone who presented very well. So that helped. Yeah, that's just one of those other things, you know, in terms of in the state of New Jersey, when we look at protected classes, source of income is a protected class of sorts that's in New right. Jersey. You can't uh, discriminate against it, yet yeah, realtors do. Racketeering or something illegal. If it's a legal source of income, <laughs> yeah. you can't use that in the judgment. Yeah, the suitcase doesn't. Mm -mm. I worked in the leasing um, business, and there's a way also if you can't make the minimum credit um, score, is you could have somebody be a grant guarantor for you, and possibly you could present that as a case where somebody actually signs a lease and says if they renege on their payments that they're going to pay for them. So that's another way of getting around that. Yeah, there can be. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Yeah, just remember our job is to help people. Yeah, we're and, paid to problem solve. Yep, yep. What else, guys? What else is brewing out there that you're coming across or questions that you have or this is your chance to champ to stump the chump here, right? <laughs> And I would only be talking about myself in that way for sure. Well, what I found was that uh, when, uh, agents, I speak to a lot of agents, and um, many, many agents, and you probably, the majority of the agents on this call, uh, the dozen or so that are on, are, are likely new agents or newer agents. And, and many of them just don't necessarily know what to ask at that very moment when you say, What do you want to talk about? And many agents are saying, Just tell me what to do next. Tell me what I need to do in the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. What should I be doing as a new agent? Do you have suggestions, Ron? Because I, I have do. I want to hear, I want to hear you, Ron. There's one, so there's one, um, I guess there's one thing that we always start off with, and it's in, it's in any uh, 30, 60, 90 plan. Uh, it doesn't matter what you intend on doing in this business. The foundation of this business, the lifeblood of this business will always be your database so you have to get it organized that's all those has to be the first thing obviously we have a crm that gives us the ability to do it in an organized fashion and then honestly just doing i know it sounds too simple maybe but just doing your 10 fours so what's just the 10 fours just for those yeah. that are uninitiated into ignite what's the 10 four yeah you're gonna 10. preview <laughs> yeah go ahead you can go you can finish <laughs> Well, Leslie knows because she's on top of the leaderboard a lot in our Ignite class. Here's what the 10-4 guys is. There's yeah. four key areas that we want you to do 10 things every day. Number one, find 10 people to put into your database every day. And here's the thing. When you're newer and you're starting out, it's not that hard to go through your phone and your telephone book and all that stuff. Facebook, all of that. All that stuff, right? Once that's filled up and you got all those people in, then it gets challenging, doesn't it, Leslie? Because now in order to find new people to put in your database, you got to be going out and meeting new people. But right. the 10-4 is add 10 people to your database every day. Here's the second 10-4. Have a conversation of a real estate nature every day with someone in your database, 10, 10 different people, 10 real estate related conversations with people that you already have a relationship with, 10 a day. And the third thing is 10 what? Handwritten notes, right? 10 handwritten notes. When you take the time to write a handwritten note to somebody. And so here's how it goes. Maybe I met you at an open house and rather than sending you a text or an email, I just write a handwritten note card that says it was great to meet you. 
anything that we can do to be of service to you, here's my business card. I look forward to being in touch. Three sentences, stamp, mailbox, done. The handwritten notes are a differentiator. And all the research tells us that the handwritten note creates a sense of almost the, the reciprocal effect, almost it's kind of like the law of reciprocity. We, people want to do something back for you because you took the extra effort to pay attention to them. Hmm. And, then, and then finally, the last in the 10-4 is preview property, right? You, gotta, you can't sell what you don't know. You got to get out and see it. We want you to see the inside of 10 homes every week. So those are the 10-4, right? And Ron, you, you, that's it for those. That's what the 10-4 is. Yeah, now that last one, that last one, I will tell you that many agents, that, it doesn't matter if you're new or veteran, um, do not do it. Guaranteed. I speak to many, many agents. They just do not do it. They do not take the time to do it. I don't know what they do you know, from nine to five every single day. <laughs> if they do not do that yet, that particular activity, that just previewing homes will provide you a great deal of confidence, a great deal of expertise. And you can build that very, very quickly, more so than an agent that's been doing this for 10, 15, 20 years. All you have to do is go see some properties and you will become an expert in that particular locale and it'll provide you a great deal of confidence. And then you will be prepared for what I call the opportunities. Because what happens is the opportunities, somebody can refer business, somebody wants to work with you and you may not be prepared yet if you did the footwork and if you prepared for the opportunity you will take advantage of the opportunity. And somebody says, I'm looking in this town and you've already seen all the inventory. You have a much higher likelihood of converting them into business. Now, Ron, are you getting any pushback from either listing agents or sellers when you're just looking to preview a home? Never had it. Um, so if I, if I ever get some pushback, it's likely because um, they don't, uh, you know, they have a pet maybe a dog, they need to take them out for a walk and for preview, they won't uh, accommodate or maybe they want to limit the showings. So I'll just follow up with, well, do you have any scheduled appointments? Like, well, we have them later on today, 2 p.m. Great. Would it be okay if I piggybacked on that? I'll be really quick, two, three minutes in and out, right before, right, right after. Would that be okay? And they say, fine. So I, I haven't had, I don't have, like, I can't remember ever a time where I was, have not been able to get in and take a look at a house. Okay. Um, if I could add to the 10-4, I'm a real fan of the, thank you, Ron, of the um, KW app. And I'd love for people to add that to their list of, go ahead and share that app with 10 people every day. I think that will pay you back in spades. It really helps um, re-image you, especially as you're a new person, re-image you to your sphere of influence. You know, and it's really interesting, again, when you think about the numbers here, what we know is if you look at internet traffic, one of the things, one of the highest things that people search on the internet is property, right? People want to look at homes. They look at homes all the time on the internet. And the other thing that we know is that about 70, over 70% 70 of all internet searches are done by handheld mobile devices. They're not being done on tablets. They're not being done on desktops. They're being done on phones. And so why not give people an opportunity to search for homes on their phone using your app? That just seems to be such a no-brainer, doesn't it? Yeah, it's so easy. Yeah. Dan, you have your, uh, Daniel, you have your hand up. Hey, yeah, so just to piggyback off of what was just being said today, um, excuse my ignorance, I'm fairly new to this, but Ron, I mean, what's the process of that? Go through the MLS and see what homes are on the market in a particular market and then reach out to them individually? Or you have to go to a broker, to, to an agent for that. Did we lose Ron? Yeah, it's no. Through, no, I'm here. I'm here. It's a, yeah, through showing time. It's a, it's a tool that we use quite often. Um, there are some agents to still say, please text, please call. For the most part, many the majority of the agents are using utilizing showing time already. Yet, before you go, it's always a benefit to go see homes and preview homes. Yet, I would always focus on a particular area that you want to focus uh, grow your bit, uh, grow your business in, um, which also connects to your strategy, your path uh, on what you're looking to do. So everybody looks a little bit different. Why? Because you may be focusing on Glenrock and somebody else focuses on Saddlebrook and that's okay. There's no right or wrong. It just depends on where you want to focus on growing your business. So I always say start there, prioritize that particular area 
as long uh, as well as all of your lead gen activities. So if you choose, okay, there's no right or wrong with lead gen activities, but if you choose to systemize and uh, focus on a particular lead gen activity, I say prioritize particular areas that you're looking to become an expert in and grow your business in. So if you're doing open houses, always focus, look at that town first. And if uh, you don't have uh, um, opportunities in that town, go to the next town. If you're door knocking, circle prospecting, farming, uh, calling expires for sale by owners, calling absentee landlords, whatever your lead gen activity of choice is, that you're going to systemize social media, um, focus on a particular town and then go from there. So prioritize and then uh, it'll benefit you in a great way. It, it, it's, especially to a new agent, it's, it's difficult to communicate some uh, how much of a benefit it is to be uh, localized. Yet I would um, argue that uh, if you take all of the top agents in BC, very much on good towns, demographics, products, they all do certain things really, really well. Uh, so it takes, you know, you have to do it one step at a time. So I say whatever your lead gen activity is, connect it to your uh, growth pattern, to your strategy, to, which is another conversation we need to be having. Uh, you know, obviously there's a, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. I think I was, it was that Jim Rohn or Don Maxwell or one of them. I think it's Jim <laughs> Rohn. It's, it's particularly yeah. troubling because yeah. I'm driving a car right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so I, I know I where I'm that. Going, Thank you, and, and I know no. I'm going to get there, but you know, and I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. I don't mean to overwhelm anybody yet. Um, you know, I say if you're going to preview homes, I'm simplifying now. Just kind of focus on a particular town and become the expert in that area first before you just go all over the place and see everything. And then here's the mechanics of that. Here's to, to unpack the mechanics. You pick a town. You go into the MLS and you look in the MLS and see what the showing instructions are. The showing instructions usually are to use this showing time software to schedule an appointment. And what you're going to do is you're going to schedule an appointment as if you were going to show it to a client. You're just going to preview it yourself. And showing time allows you to classify it as a showing a preview, right? So you're going to, whatever the instructions are from the listing agent in terms of how to get in, you just follow that. And you make that because you're licensed yourself, you would go to the house, you would open up the door with your lockbox key and walk around, you take a look, you get a feel for the house. That's how you do it. Right? Okay, that's lockboxes. Yes, that's okay. I didn't want to inconvenience people for no reason. So that, that makes more sense to me. Um, and I was going to segue to another the other question I had, if you wanted to finish up how- you yeah, Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I haven't, uh, I actually may have a, a, buy, a seller uh, coming up, but in the meantime, I have someone who, uh, is looking to rent and not in the county that I'm familiar with. So what is the, what is the process with that? It's a renter. So I don't know, you know, obviously the fees aren't as great. Um, of course, money is money, but um, it's in a different county. So what's the process with that? If I don't have the MLS, do I, do I, I mean, I'm not, not I would do it, but maybe it'd be better to refer someone. Well, what county is it, Dan? Is it a county that you do have access to? Because your New Jersey MLS is multiple counties. Uh, you know, I'm not familiar with the county. It's, it's wherever um, Montclair is. Yeah, that's Essex County. That would Essex actually county. be the Garden State MLS. Okay. And you would add, you could join that just as you join the New Jersey MLS. I think it's like, what is it, Patty? Sixty-two fifty per per half of the year. Or Six, something? Yeah, yep. Yeah. It's real easy to join. Okay. You you get the forms from your uh, in our case Stephanie. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's real easy. Understand if you join right now, it's going to be sixty-two fifty, and as of June thirtieth, you have to pay sixty-two fifty again. They do not prorate because they're so inexpensive. But okay. If you, okay. for 62 bucks, if you could have the access to that property, see it all, all those rentals yourself and not need yeah. to refer it out, you know, yeah. it might be worth it for you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Nancy's then, uh, been, oops, yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, that, that's good. Okay, and then I just pursue it that way through the agent, whoever has the uh, listing. Yeah, and just to okay. connect the dots here, then we'll get to the raised hand. You know, the thing about the MLSs, guys, is I think there's 11 different multiple listing services in New Jersey. And the, why that matters is you really can only, why your license allows you to do business anywhere in New Jersey. And it doesn't matter what county, whether it's commercial, residential, anything else. The, the point of access is the MLS. And if you don't personally belong to the MLS, 
you're not going to be able to find that inventory to see it. And more importantly, your lockbox key will not unlock a lockbox for a different MLS. It's a different set of codes, a different set of keys. And so, for example, in the Garden State MLS, we have lockboxes provided by Garden State. For the New Jersey MLS, we have lockboxes provided by New Jersey MLS. And your membership in those MLSs is going to give you access to use your key to open those up. Right. Sometimes homes are listed on both MLSs and the lockbox will have a, a label, either GS or NJ on it, which will guide you. But Hal brings a, up a good point uh, because agents have gotten caught uh, wanting to show something in another MLS and not being properly uh, accessed. Yeah. But Garden State has much better reach than NJ. Um, Garden State does... Passaic, Morris, Essex, Sussex. Do you know what else, Hal? I mean, that's... Well, the New Jersey MLS, the one that, which is our primary, is Bergen, Passaic, parts of Hudson. Garden State is yeah. Essex, Union, parts of yeah. Hudson, parts of Passaic, mm -hmm. Somerset, um, Hunterdon, Warren. Yeah. Everything from Mercer County, and really everything from Middlesex County North is part of the Garden State MLS except Bergen County and Passaic and parts of Hudson. Hudson has its own MLS. Yes, Hudson has its own MLS. Uh, this is confusing, okay. right? Uh, that's, it's, it's too many little fiefdoms out there. Exactly. But there I would are, say if you're going to do are. business in North Jersey, belong to New Jersey and simultaneously Garden State. State, you're going to be able to do anything you want to do from an MLS standpoint, absent Hudson County. Okay, thank you. Nancy has been very patient. I can't wait any longer to hear what she has to ask. And then I have to say something to her after you're done, but I want to hear what she has to ask. I have to say something really good now. It's just like a lot of pressure. Um, so it's not going to be that great. But um, so I've been working on trying to generate fire leads lately. And um, I just have like a Facebook ad up right now. But um, Patty was talking about sharing the app and I just got an idea. Um, what do you guys, how do you guys feel about sharing the app or sharing a link to your own um, website, your own branded website, um, like on your own Facebook page and boosting that post. Is that something that a lot of people do or thought of before? As a way of driving traffic to your Facebook page to put a put the link to your branded Facebook, uh, your branded KW page on your personal Facebook page or your yes. business Facebook page. Yes, or even sharing the app directly on it because yeah. people are on their phones looking at Facebook. And then that way you could get your alert in command and then the buyers can just search directly on there. And well, then how would you share the app on a Facebook page? Um, let me see. One thing you could do is you could create a link. Yeah, you, could, you can create a URL you create and, um, and you can uh, copy and paste it on your Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Or, or your Instagram. Okay. So I guess this is already been. Here's done. the one thing I would say the one thing you said about boosting the post. I, I will tell you, as somebody who's paid a lot of money for Facebook coaches and other businesses, boosting of posting, boosting of Facebook posts is probably the biggest waste of money that there is. And the reason for that is it's non discriminant. It doesn't, it sends it out to everybody. What, what we would know is to get somebody to download our branded app they're more likely to do it if they already have a relationship with you. Because if they don't know you, they're not going to be inclined to download your app. So just boosting it out there and spending dollars to push it out to the masses, I don't think is going to pay. But making sure that you get it into your personal feed so that everybody who knows you has it, I think that's going to pay huge. And then here's the other thing I was going to say to you before, because for how long have I known you? And you've been coming to class after class, Ignite, lots of different places. And I always see your name as Anne and oh. call on you as Anne. Oh, and yeah. I just heard Patty call you Nancy. <laughs> you prefer? I know. No, Anne is fine. You know what? Nancy is just, it's my nickname. So. All right, Nancy. You're going to be Nancy from here on in. You're Nancy now. <laughs> no, it's funny. I was looking on the screen for Nancy. I'm like, who's Nancy? <laughs> you can change those three dots and put Nancy. You can. Nancy. I might do that too. You never know. <laughs> That's right. We can all become Nancy tonight. I had just wanted to say to Daniel that, so I had two instances where I was working with two different buyers and 
lo and behold, I'm a member of the New Jersey MLS and they, you know, they wanted to see homes that were in the garden state. Um, so I went and I mean, I know that I can join and I still may, but I haven't yet. Um, I texted the listing agent and just said that I have a buyer who wants to see the property. Um, I texted them my business card that has my license on it, or maybe I sent them my license number in addition because they asked, you know, for it. Um, okay. And then they just sent me the code. Okay. So there are, so there are, I don't know if that's illegal, but um, there are some people that would work with you and not to say that I'm going to try and make that a habit, but, um, you know. They Sorry. sent you the code for what, Leslie? For the lockbox. So this was the lockbox that had a combination box on it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. That only okay. Works, that would never work with a super. I'm like, well, how did they No, no, no. That? Sorry. Sorry. I should have prefaced that yeah, with uh, combination. Yeah. Which yeah. is really common in Hudson County. A lot of combos still happen in Hudson County. Right. So interesting. And some realtors will use a combo because they're cheaper. <laughs> well, you know, this is a sidebar for the last pretty much the better part of the past 15 years. The New Jersey Association of Realtors Legal Council has, has counseled brokers against allowing combination lockboxes. And the reason being? Because they're so easy to defeat. Yeah. Yep. You can break a combination lockbox really easily. It almost is indestructible to break a Supra. And what the law states, and this is what New Jersey Association's uh, counsel says, the law states that as a broker, if there's a more secure methodology for protecting right. someone's house and you choose not to take it, then if something bad happens, that you will be liable for treble damages. Yep. So you're starting to see those combination boxes, even in places like Hudson County, where it's been the way for years and years and years, you're starting to see those go away. Yeah, they're, they're, um, they're not good because they don't record who's come into the house. Yeah. Okay. But if you, but if you know there's one there, the combination box got you in. That's a good yeah, that's right. <laughs> twice <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, here's, the other, here's the other thought dan for just to kind of keep playing this thread a little bit you have to decide as a as a business person where your area of expertise is and where it isn't you heard ron talk about how critical it is to become an expert in your market and you do your lead generation in a target market anybody who's been in my classes has heard me beating this drum forever because it's too hard to become um, an expert in everything and consumers really demand that you've got hyper local expertise. And the thing we have to decide is where can I serve clients well because I know the market well and where would they truly be better served by another agent? And do we have the integrity to refer it out and not just try to save the commission dollars and do it ourselves when in fact, maybe another agent would be a better source for them in a different market, right? I use by way of an example, you can have two different doctors, right? And both of them are really good with a scalpel. But when it comes time for open heart surgery, I'm not letting my orthodontist do it because that's not where his expertise is. <laughs> and it's a little bit the same thing. And you know, part of our fiduciary responsibility that are in our fiduciary responsibility that stands for reasonable care, right? It re it's really on us to know where our expertise is and where it isn't and what the code of ethics requires is that if we find ourselves being asked to serve a client with a skill set that we don't have, either A, we refer it, or B, we invite someone else to partner with us who has that set of skills, right? That's what reasonable care looks like. I think that initially coming from a new agent, because I am one, that we're so eager and ready to do it that we just I'm not want to do things the hard way, but instead of asking for help, even though I think that help is great, you know, we try to just do whatever we can. So I remember when I, you know, I first started, I think it was my first three weeks, I went to Patty and I said, I have somebody <laughs> who's looking to rent and I'm focusing on Bergen County, but she's looking all over the place. And, and she ended up in Union and she's like, you know, maybe you just want to refer. And I said, no, no, this is going to be my first deal. I can't refer. Yep. And, yeah. you know. So. You know, I, and as a new agent, you're like, you're so anxious to get the experience. You're so anxious to feel it. And you're but so as your to get the career... commission dollars. Let's be honest. We need some money coming in. We can't... <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, baby, I need the dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, as I'm... your career moves along, you'll realize that, yes. you know, when you figure out your per hour 
fee, it's better yeah. to refer. It, but no, it's I just it's, that. it's crazy. But Daniel, I'm sure you're exactly. Well, I don't know if you're you have the same thought that I'm about to say, but I mean, I've had, you know, maybe three buyers in the last two week week or two weeks, and you know, I took one out, and they said, oh, you know, we're flexible, and we'll be anyway. You know, we're flexible to any county anywhere in New Jersey and I even texted Patty and I said I think I converted to Bergen because she was all over the place and I don't know what it is it's you know I want to take buyers out and I want to keep them in Bergen just because that's where I'm looking to focus but it's like I'm attracting all these people who don't want to be where I you know want to show them so it's frustrating and challenging so and maybe yeah. the the universe is telling you it's time to because what will happen is that your consumers will pull you and make you increase your geography. I have to tell you, I back Ron 100% when he says, focus on an area. I love to listen to Ron. He knows exactly how many homes are on the market in Fairlawn, how many are under contract. He, mean, he knows everything, the average price, everything. So that's a direction that you all should be going in. And yet at the same time, your consumers will... Um, help you grow beyond your primary market area. Yeah, I was, it was a pleasant surprise to, to hear focus on only one or two markets from what I've done in the past. I've always been so scattered and it doesn't, it's not a recipe for success, obviously. Um, it was more like you have no business sending this away, you know, like you have to take this, this rental, you know, go for it. So that I, I feel better. I don't mind referring it at all. It actually is much better in the long run. I, I know that it's like the uh, nothing, you know, um, no good deed goes un, undone or something like that. Um, unpunished. So, unpunished. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that's fine. I appreciate that. Thank you. you. Know what I'm going to share with you though, Dan, here's some, something that's so counterintuitive because I think a lot of times we really believe that in order to, have the best opportunity to serve clients, we've got to be able to be a jack of all trades. We've, we don't know where our clients are going to need us. We don't know what towns they want to be in. So I need to learn a little bit of thing about everything. And, and paradoxically, there's no faster way to fail in this industry than to try to do that. And the reason being is that consumers demand in order for you to be hireable to them, you have to have the specific knowledge. And so what you really, it's interesting, if you dig down into the numbers, and I'm a data geek, so you, you have to indulge me in this, but I've studied every MLS in New Jersey multiple times. And here's what you are going to find consistently. If you look at the agents who are doing the most business, and if you go to New Jersey MLS, it's the same in Garden State, it's the same in Hudson, it's the same in every one. Look at the top 10 agents based on units sold. And guys, when you get top 10 in an MLS right now, you're, you're doing a lot of volume. And, and Ron, you guys are number one in the, New Jer in the New Jersey MLS. And so we're talking hundreds of units a year. Here's what you're going to find. To almost very little exception, the agents do between 20 and 60%, or excuse me, between 40 and 60% of the business that they do, hundreds and hundreds of units in one town, maybe two. I remember you saying that, yeah. They don't spread out. They don't. Now, here's what happens. Your clients are going to want to go where your clients are going to want to go, which is why I would never say don't do business in another town. But I would say do not lead generate outside of your target. Mm -hmm. Because when you lead generate in your target, what is it going to do? It's going to give you listing opportunities in the town that you're trying to create market share. And when you control inventory in that town, it's going to attract buyers who want to be where you already are. And when you've got buyers in the pipeline and not enough inventory, it gives you an opportunity to prospect for what? More sellers in the area where you already are. If you lead generate, what's going to happen is that eventually that market world is going to get closer and tighter and tighter over time. Your sphere of influence is going to give you leads wherever they have them. If you got a brother who says, "Hey, would you would you work with my my buddy from work who's got a listing and it happens to be at Hackensack?" You're not going to say, "No, I can't do Hackensack." That would be foolish if you could do it. But there would be no reason to lead generate in Hackensack if your business was trying to be forward somewhere else, right? That's the strategy here. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. And you'll build momentum quicker than you think. Quicker than you think. Yeah, I'm excited.
good. Mm -hmm. I will yeah. say too, I admire that quality that Leslie and Daniel, that you guys were talking about being very brave and kind of like just going for it, like right out the gate. Cause I feel like it's better to be like that than to be overly timid and overly cautious in the beginning. Cause I felt like I was very, very cautious in the beginning, like fail forward. I'm yeah. still very cautious in. I mean, trust me, uh, there are days I'm like, I don't know that I can do this. And I'm like, what do you mean? And then I, you know, I push these motivational Monday quotes and I'm like, yeah. read what you're posting. It's <laughs> so <laughs> Guys, I've been, I've been around entrepreneurs for a long time and in real estate and other business as well. Here's the thing, to be successful as an entrepreneur, you've got to be a risk taker. And sometimes that risk taking requires you to sometimes put yourself out there when you're not 100% sure what you're doing, especially in our industry. Because why? Because we're the only industry that I know of, bar none. I can't think of another one. And if you know of one, tell me, but I can't think of another industry where you are an independent contractor, where you do not get paid until you produce a result and you're being asked to go out and produce results in an area where you don't know anything. It's crazy backwards. Every other industry, you develop a set of skills and then you go to the marketplace as an independent. But we do it backwards. And so you've got to be willing to take some risk, but understand this, the difference between entrepreneurs is that they're risk takers, but they are not gamblers. And there's a big difference between being a risk taker and being a gambler. A risk taker knows the, the edges of what they know and what they don't. And they invite partners in to help them in the areas where they're not trained. A gambler is somebody that's like, I'll just figure it out. Right. And yet so much of the transactions, you know, we prepare as much as we can. To be honest, you can't prepare 100 percent because we've got so many variables. We've got buyers and it might be two buyers and then you've got sellers and it might be two sellers and you've got another realtor. And then you enter into the formula attorneys, inspectors. And so it's difficult to be totally prepared with all of those variables because they change on every transaction. Yeah, they do. And that's why people skills and caring, really caring for the individuals matters. Yeah. And just to kind of piggy off, um, piggyback off of that, being a new agent myself, um, I know that I kind of had that same feeling as of, you know, I want to help out wherever my clients want to go, wherever they want to buy a house, I want to be able to. But I came to a realization is that Unfortunately, New Jersey is so big that I can't know every county and the way I work and the way I strategize is at least I know my product within my market and I know it very well that I can sell it. So being that, you know, I had someone wanting to buy a house in South Jersey. I don't know anything about South Jersey. <laughs> they were moving from here. I don't know anything. I had to refer them out. But like I said, I'd rather just stick to what I know and that I can sell it as best as I can. And like everyone said, just be, build the lead generation within your market. And, you know, you'll kind of just go off and build your business. I mean, you are so with, smart. You are yeah. so smart for coming so to that. Right, Amy. The riches are in the niches, guys. Just remember that. The riches are in the niches. You know, the more you try to be a jack of all trades, the more your value proposition becomes so generic that it's not compelling to anyone. Yeah. Right? You're not going to serve everyone if you develop a niche expertise, but you are going to dominate your niche and there will be more business for you there than you'll ever be able to get anywhere else. And, and don't forget to kind of calculate, even if it's a rough calculation, your how much per hour, because if you are doing business way out of your area and you're driving repeatedly, uh, what does it boil down to per hour when you finally do? help a client either sell their home or get settled. And, and then here's what's going to happen. And this is what happened to me early on until I stopped it. When I first started, I worked, I live in Westfield, which is Union County. My office was in Wachung, which is Somerset County. And a lot of the business that came my way at that time through the broker's marketing was further south in Hunter Inn and Somerset County, farther and farther away. And so what ended up happening is I started taking listings in places like Bell Mead and Hillsboro and places like that. And what did it do? It attracted buyers that wanted to be down there. And then suddenly my whole area of expertise was in an area that I didn't know or want to be in, right? So you take control of that right out of the gate, pick a lane, go out and preview that property in that target market, 
get out there and see all the open houses in that target market, get to know everything about the communities in that target market and become a hyper local ninja. And you're, <laughs> I like that. You're going to become, you're going to become more profitable more quickly because you're going to build momentum faster. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Wow. I just want to add one more quickly. thing to what Patty said before. Yeah, it went by real quick, but uh, I'd like to end on a, a uh, piece of advice. So what you mentioned before, Patty, yeah, there's so many moving parts. Just when you think you've seen it all, well, surprise, <laughs> something comes up that you haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a good piece of advice is um, be a solution finder, not a fault finder. And uh, what that looks like is just, I found that the best question I ask myself, which helps me more than in any other question in those types of situations is what's the best way to move forward so i need to when, when you feel frustrated and things don't always go your way just ask yourself that one question what's the best way to move forward and that's that'll create um an opportunity to be a solution finder that sounds like a great way to end the session tonight on a very positive note mr benz yeah, I love it. You know, it's a great positive note and it's a great way to end. What's the best way to move forward? How can I find the best in people and not the worst in people? That's just a, a great pathway to, to live your life, much less run your business. I love it. Tomorrow, guys, we're going to be a little more focused in this time, focusing on buyers. And again, with, Ron is going to be Ron. here. With yeah. Ron is going to be here as well. And Patty is going to be here as well. I won't be with you tomorrow night. I'll be back next week. But um you know, this, what I can share, and, uh, and, and maybe I'll see if I can find a way to jump on tomorrow night for a little bit, but what I can share is this is probably arguably the hardest buyer's market that I've ever seen in my 18 years in this industry. Yeah, I agree. It is brutally hard, simply because the lack of inventory and the amount of qualified buyers out there is making it mm -hmm. that this is a market that's driven by emotion and not logic. And, and anytime you're trying to play a game where the rules are driven by emotion and not logic, it's really hard to play this game. But we're going to do our best to kind of help you think about how can you work with buyers in a way to help them have success? And what can you do to help them narrow their focus into a game that they can win and not try to play a game of competition that they can't win, right? That's our job as consultants is to put them, just like any other good coach, you think about the very best coaches, and what do they do? They know their players and they put their players at the right spot so that they can play their best game and win, right? And, and for us and buyers, what we have to do is figure out how is our buyer gonna win this competitive game? What can we do in terms of financing? What can we do in terms of how to structure offers? How do we help them manage their expectations so that they can win and not just compete, right? So that's gonna be more tomorrow. So it should be a great topic. Looking forward to it. Seven o'clock, same link. Same bat time, same bat channel. No, I'm sorry, six o'clock, six to seven. Ah, Woo. Six to seven, almost six, got that. Yeah, six to seven, same link. And uh, meanwhile, everybody have a great day. Make Bye. it great. Be well. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you, everyone. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, Ron, can you, put your, can you put your info in the chat? We're gonna, yeah, I'm going to put it in right now. Oh, okay. We're gonna, I won't close out the room so everybody has a chance to get Ron's information. Thanks. All right. So Ron Dugashi. And happy belated birthday, by the way. Thank oh, you. Oh, happy birthday, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. So that is my phone number. It, it is used daily by other agents. You're, you, know, you can feel free to walk. Uh, you're welcome to use it as well. All right. Happy belated birthday. Thank you, everyone. See you, you. tomorrow. Thank All you. All right. Have Take care. One.